So uh, uh, thanks for having me, and uh, and I, we made it through traffic okay, <laughs> an hour and a half, I, you know, but that's that's all right. So so I, actually, uh, <laughs> I want to talk about something that uh, that is quite relevant to higher education and and our approach, and how actually in many ways higher education was set up and still reproduces social linguistic inequality. And, and what we can do about, about it, some of the programs that we've instituted and so forth. And, and, and so let's, let's start with this simple card that, uh, that we find somewhere. I don't judge people based on race, creed, color, or gender. I judge people based on spelling, grammar, punctuation, and sentence structure. Uh, and, and in a sense, what that's saying is that higher education has become quite sensitive to some dimensions of inequality, including race, religion, you know, uh, gender, and so forth, but at the same time has more or less ignored language discrimination. All right, so if you see this quote here from uh, Lippy Green, which is a well known quote now that about discrimination based on language variation is so commonly accepted, so widely perceived as appropriate, that it must be seen as the last back door to discrimination. And the door stands wide open. So that's the point that I, that I want to make. Uh, here's another comment uh, about academics. And, and one of the things that I've learned about academics is they can be very progressive but they can also be quite selective in terms of their progressive thinking. And, and one of the points that I try, would like to make is that our progressive colleagues have in fact uh, ignored the significant impact of accent and dialect, okay? So where did it start? Everybody know where this is? It's Harvard Yard. <laughs> All right, and symbolically, the door is closed. <laughs> All right, so where did this start in terms of, well, the fact of the matter is that early on, language was quite linked to nationhood in the United States. All right, there are arguments about language, there were arguments about official language, and even today, there is a gap and we have a sort of colonial lag. Uh, some years ago, we did a study of dialects and perceptions that people had. Very interesting, very interesting outcome. And think about what that might mean. The upshot was there are no dialects of American English that are really prestigious. If you ask people about prestigious dialects, where do they turn? To England, right? So that, so that basically, British dialects are prestigious. American English dialects are okay. Uh, when do you think this started? Oh, several centuries ago. We still are under that effect, uh, which is kind of a, which is kind of a, a serious indictment. They're also related to issues of power and identity how language is, uh, is something that the dominant classes uh, inflict on those who are not dominant. And in terms of education, one of the things that you have to think of is why was education set up? It was never set up for people of common means. It was set up for the elite to begin with. So early discussions for about, about languages by our quote founders we're over elitist languages. Should we be teaching Greek and Latin? You know, are these the, these are the prestige languages? So there were early debates about that, and and actually the the impetus to teach spoken language, uh, other languages was not didn't take place until a couple hundred years later than that. So it, it's kind of an interesting thing because it wasn't really until the GI Bill and commoners like me could have access to college that other than the elite people were included, all right? And so we have 
uh, a college education system that is elitist in terms of how it was established, elitist in, tell, in terms of how it progressed, and still is fighting with that elitist sort of tradition that we're now trying to expand. Uh, actually, as a matter of fact, uh, I grew up as a working class kid in Philadelphia, in the inner city. I never even knew a college graduate, all right? Because only privileged kids in my neighborhood, and there one, were none, because it was a poor neighborhood of blocks of houses, you know, so I, I had great playmates. I could walk out the door, and there were a hundred houses surrounding us, and we could always have something to play with. But it wasn't geared for college. And, and, and so when I went to, uh, I'll, I'll tell you this story, I probably shouldn't, but I'll tell you it anyhow. All right, so when I went to college, my parents were German immigrants with an eighth grade education. They told me there was a test that I had to take if I wanted to go to college. I wanted to go to college and play sports. I said, oh, what's that? Okay, so it was the SAT, so I went and I scored under 500 in verbal. I would never have gotten into Duke. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, it's true, all right? Uh, isn't it? So, but, but the interesting thing was I had no idea what this test was, why I was taking it, except that a counselor said, you're a pretty good student. You should go to college. And so, but there's this test you have to take. Okay, where do I take it? And I took it. And I was horrific in terms of... Uh, but I did have one advantage. My parents never corrected me in English. I corrected them <laughs> because they didn't speak English as a first language. And so, so I had one great advantage. I was never corrected in how I spoke until I got to college in Illinois when everybody made fun of the way I talked because I came from Philadelphia. So, okay, but the point here is that it was set up on an elitist basis. Uh, some of us were fortunate enough to sort of overcome that through, well, I don't know, everything from birth order. I was the youngest of six and the only one who got an opportunity to go to college, uh, to sort of being a male. Uh, in our neighborhood, nobody went to college, but if anybody did, they went for engineering and they were males. And, and so there are a lot of factors that uh, I won't give you my full history today, but, but I do want you to understand this. Okay, so we come to college and here academics are the gatekeepers, the guardians and the authorities in the use of language, all right? So I got to Illinois, I'd never been outside of, I'd never been west of Pennsylvania, and my Philadelphia dialect was very noticeable people to people, all right? As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, 50 years later I went back because I played on the last undefeated football team. And so we had a 50 year reunion and we ran around the table and people said, well, what do you remember about your colleagues, all right, that I hadn't seen for 50 years? First thing they remembered is I talked funny. <laughs> 50 years later, they remembered that I talked funny. All right, because I had a Philadelphia dialect, which I thought was perfectly normal, and how everybody spoke, I thought I was really doing well. I didn't have a German accent, and so I was really okay. <laughs> All right, and here they told me, yeah, that was the first thing we noticed about you. All right, and so I called up my girlfriend. We had three minutes to discuss my dilemma, and I said, I don't know if I'm gonna make it in college. And she's, that's okay, you can come home, work in a factory, we'll get married. Okay, <laughs> all right, so, all right. so that's, the, uh, that's the background that I bring to you tonight, all right, as one who suffered in this dilemma. So, uh, at State, and I guess we're supposed to call it an anonymous uni urban university, large urban urban university in the south, all right, <laughs> right down the road, 20 miles, <laughs> okay. okay. So I had a, a couple of our students did some really interesting studies. So I want to report on them and then talk about what we've done in response, because the point is the system has, has basically sucked us all in, and now we sort of, what do we do now 
to sort of change the paradigm. So she took kids who came to the university from Appalachia, all right? Uh, and so she interviewed them. She did, uh, she, she, uh, did recordings with them. She analyzed their vowel systems and so forth. But she also interviewed them about what they said about college and about their feelings and so forth. So one of the things that Stephanie A. Brett Dunstan in this 2013 dissertation said, uh, one student, I don't really speak up too much in class and stuff like that unless I feel really comfortable because I can hear, you know, people snickering or stuff that I, uh, when I talk, all right? So, so here was someone who was very sensitive and so it had an effect on her contribution to class. She was hesitant. All right, or another one here. Sometimes I think that people might think that I'm not educated just because I have this accent. And you hear a country accent and you think hillbilly and then hillbilly, so no education. So I think it's just a social norm to think that way. So you get these sorts of responses. All right, and, and so she had a number of interviews and I could go on with the quotes, but I won't. So, uh, oh, about four or five years ago, we decided that we were going to do a language diversity program at state and sort of include language in the diversity canon. All right, so we had this thing. So a week before I was supposed to give the first lecture, I walked out of my office and eavesdropped the conversation that was taking place in the hall. And here's what the conversation was. So this guy, I think they were flirting to the extent that I can sort of recognize that uh, <laughs> at my advanced stage of life. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> so, so the young woman says to the young man, Asians have weird accents. They use sounds that don't even exist. And he says, yeah, yeah, I know. And I'm like, what is it? Like, how can they use sounds that don't exist? And I'm like, dude, I mean, but you know, you can't say, excuse me. I overheard your conversation. I really didn't want to, and it's just horrific. So do you mind if I have a conversation with you? So I just sort of went along. But the point is, and as you have experienced at Duke with some of the comments, you know, these sorts of comments and commentary exist at universities everywhere, you know? Uh, okay, so, th so that's fine, but then We've done a lot of research around uh, the state, as, as was mentioned. And, uh, and so we've had a lot of press from the NNO and so forth about our projects. And so one of my colleagues, Robin Dodsworth, has done research on the changing speech of big cities like Raleigh, okay? And so there was a nice article in the NNO. So the day after the article, I was standing at the light, waiting to cross the street, and a distinguished sociology professor comes up to me and says, Walt, I read the article in the newspaper and that's not how older people from Raleigh talk. Not if they're educated. And I thought, gee, w would I say to her, I read about your article on uh, socioeconomic status and that's not how it is? I mean, but here's what's interesting about it when you look below the surface. Okay, first of all, she was appropriating expert status. I know, right? I'm a sociologist, but I know about language, right? And then, poor Robin, she measured over 10,000 vowels as a part of her study, and it was very, and it was very rigorously done, and basically her data was trivialized. Like, what you found in terms of your data is irrelevant. And the third thing that she did was she exacted a linguistic subordination scenario to it. So here's how I interpret it, you know, that, uh, which is kind of interesting because she felt she spoke English. She had lived in this area a long time and therefore she had a right to be an expert in her comments about language as a distinguished sociologist. Uh, would I do the same thing uh, as a non-sociologist? Okay, so this, these are, I'm gonna summarize a few things that, uh, that Stephanie Dunstan found in her dissertation. First of all, she found that course participation was affected by the perception that people had 
of Appalachian dialect in this case. It could have been any variety of dialects. All right? Uh, and the kids who felt that they spoke a non-normative dialect said they were much more hesitant to talk. Okay? The second thing that it suggests that she found is that vernacular dialects add barriers to social and socioeconomic settings. So you always need to prove your intelligence and overcome your stereotypes. Because if you're to talk that way, then you have to prove that you're not the way that we associate that dialect. And then another thing is that going to college from where you are heightens your awareness of language stigmatization. I thought that I simply spoke normal for everybody in Philadelphia and then I went to college where my sensitivity to being different was greatly enhanced. And lots of kids who come to college from areas that have distinct dialects also feel that way. It heightens their feeling that the way they speak is stigmatized. I spoke normal until I went to college. Then I realized I didn't speak so normal. Okay. Uh, the, uh, another thing that was kind of surprising at first, but then when you think about it, maybe it's not as surprising, is that kids' experiences in different departments in college varied. All right? But they didn't vary in ways that you would expect from understanding sort of the distribution of sort of ideologies in universities. Because actually what happened was the kids felt a lot more pressure and a lot more evaluation of their speech in humanities and social sciences. Now, any demographic of a university in terms of the faculty ideologies and positions Will, will basically reveal that people in the STEM programs tend to be more conservative politically than people in the arts and sciences. But actually, people in the arts and sciences were more condemnatory of their speech than the STEM programs, which was kind of an interesting thing, which underscores the fact that we can be quite selective about what we're progressive about. So uh, uh, that, that's kind of an interesting, uh, <laughs> that, that's an important lesson. You know, you may think you're progressive, but there are a few areas that we'd like you to consider. Okay, <laughs> and furthermore, their sense of belonging can be influenced by the perception about dialect. Students may feel a need to accommodate. So, so actually what happened was kids from Appalachia either stayed with other kids from Appalachia or they changed the way they spoke to accommodate others that they, that they became new friends with. So it was really kind of a, a, a very enlightening study. All right, so that was cool. We got some results and we took it to the Office of Diversity and we started a program I'll tell you about in a, in a little bit. How much, how long do I talk anyhow? <laughs> Start. When did I start? Okay. <laughs> Keep going. Okay. <laughs> I have a few more slides. Okay. So, so, so we did, you know, would it be interesting to interview faculty about their experience in terms of language? So, for example, we would be interested in what kinds of things were women told about talking as they went into the academic marketplace? Uh, you know, where do they come from? I mean, nobody, well, except perhaps a few kids who are born to college professors, talk like academics growing up, all right? So we were sort of curious about where people learn to talk like this, what kind of advice they were given and so forth. So I sent out, I sent out an invitation to a third of the faculty at NC State, which is about 500 and some people, and over 80 people responded and said, yeah, I'd love to talk to you about my experience, all right? So we had 80, 80 some people who we interviewed, the recorded conversations, transcribed, and then used this as the basis of analysis. Now, I'm just gonna give you a couple of things that they said. 
Okay, which are kind of, this is just, I've selected here. So these, you know, some people said very, <laughs> some people said very sort of a enlightening things. I think they realized that <laughs> they shouldn't be as uh, intolerable as maybe they felt. Okay, so, 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 so here's, uh, other people sort of said, okay, here's what I think. So we have a, we have a Southern white professor who happens to be a male. And we're asking him about, well, how about the students in your courses? And he says, oh, and his speech patterns are very black. He's not altered his speech and so forth. So you can read this for yourself. But look at the end. Uh, and yet he's throwing out big words and big content. And I'm like, how can you look and talk like this? Because you're really making it hard for me. OK, so that's in reference to a black student. All right. Then he goes on and talks about a white female student that he has in his class. And she's from the Midwest, right? Well, that's, I guess, something cool to him. So I think, yes, that if I had this Midwestern voice, that I would use it. And so he talks to her, and, and after she gave his seminar, he said, you know, you sound like a radio announcer. You could go into radio. I said, you've got that nice Midwestern. I said, perfect. It's just beautiful, you know? Use it. And I'm thinking, man, he's, he's lucky he didn't get snagged for sexual harassment, <laughs> saying things like that, you know? Like, like he should be in the uh, HR office being interrogated, you know? Uh, like telling a woman her voice is beautiful and use it and stuff like that. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's serious stuff. Uh, but notice the contrast in terms of his perception of these students. And uh, okay, so then, then you have other sorts of things. So, so here's a stance that I call the solidarity language stance. So we have a professor, white Southern from Atlanta, professor, very Southern in her speech. And so I, I ask her, how about students? How do they perceive you? Oh, I think they like me because I think they feel like, oh, she's from the South. She knows us. I taught undergraduates last year for the first time in a very long time, and they love me. I think it had this, you know, she's one of us. It really rings that I have Southern accent when I hear myself on a video or video. I'm sure that's a part of it. Okay, so that's cool if you're from the South, but suppose you're an African American from the North in that class. You're feeling, uh, okay, so I, I taught at a historically black institution for 20 years, and most of the black students I had did not like Southern white voices. They associated them with acts of hostility, all right? So, so while she is, on the one hand, viewing her voice as projecting solidarity with her students, like which of her students is the question, and who does it marginalize? Okay, so we also had, uh, we also had African Americans that we interviewed. And you have a totally different sort of stance that they take. Here's what I refer to as the token representational stance that uh, I've been told by a couple of students over the year that I'm the very first African American person that they've ever spoken to in their life. And I ask them, what has the experience been like? And they're just like, it was a lightning, you know? You're so smart, you're so accomplished, you're so polished. And so you know how I speak is really important to make sure that those students see, you know that American, African American people can talk just like you. So she's taking a stance, like I can't be too vernacular because people are judging me on this basis. And so I need to sort of accommodate this standard norm. So we're back into the, so we can demonstrate that African Americans are as good as white folks. So, so you have very different sorts of stances, which, uh, which has been summarized by some, uh, uh, one of my students and I did an analysis based on chronotopes, all right? And, and one chronotope is sort of the comfortably white classroom, where it's normative, standard, unmarked English, regional white language solidarity, and marginalized black speech, all right? The uncomfortably black classroom, non-normative black speech, exceptionalized black instructors and students, all right, for their speech, and then the linguistic subordination ideology comes into play here. We, uh, and uh, one of uh, our recent students did a study of, of the women in this corpus and which was kind of, uh, in terms of a similar sort of uh, analogy, 
he talked about the comfortably male classroom where language classroom has flexibility, normative male language use, and unmarked male language. Now, by the same token, it, it, it reveals a sort of double bind female classroom where your sanction for indexing femina femininity. So we've, over the last couple of years, we've had a lot of discussions about uh, vocal fry, uptalk, as indicated by women, all right? And so their, so their sanction for exhibiting these sorts of traits, and in fact, and in fact, uh, a number of uh, women uh, in their interviews talked about the kinds of things that they were told by the people who mentored them, you know, which range from dress, how women should dress, as opposed to the flexibility that men have in terms of dress, how they should sound in the same, in the same discourse, you know. Not only should you dress this way, but here's how you should sound. All right, as if they're the same thing. All right, then they're at the same time sanctioned for violating gender norm expectations. All right, so you don't sound like a woman, you know? So something's wrong with that. And, and then, sort of, so what happens is that women's multiple social identities intersect to produce a kind of unique privilege and a kind of unique oppression. All right, and, and, and so, and so we, we, we see these sort of chronotopes which are magnified and exhibited in different classrooms. Here's the interesting thing, all right, I, and, and this, is, this is really important. I am sure that Duke University has a very robust diversity program, all right? All major universities do at this point, all right? So, there's a canon, however, the canon includes race, gender, sex, you know, religion, and so forth. Do you have any statements about language? What does it say about language? Hmm. Well, if so, why not? Because language variation is a critical symbolic manifestation of diversity. And what I found, uh, because we've looked at a number of diversity programs, that language is ironically excluded or erased from the Institutional Office of Diversity. All right, uh, and in that sense, I'd say universities are responsible as central sites of exacting linguistic subordination. I mean, they study about it in fourth and eighth grade, and so we developed a, a, a book for that so the kids could do it. We also have a media presence, a, a very robust uh, a YouTube station, uh, channel, and then, and then we also do institutional programs. So I actually thought I'd, I'd so what do we do in these sorts of documentaries? Okay, so I, I thought I would give you a couple of examples. So our film, Talking, uh, Talking Black in America, is basically a celebration of the history, development, and influence of African-American speech on the English language. And so if you want to sort of see, and at one point we talk about, uh, uh, we, we talk about hip hop battles. And so we have this segment where we talk about the significance, the linguistic significance of these battles. And, and so I just want you to listen to this a little. An individual's ability to speak spontaneously, authoritatively, in the vernacular is not only highly prized, but is literally used in verbal combat. When you finish round one, boy, you cast a stone. Look at the crowd, they eyes blue like they got lashes on in the draft zone. I'm with some mean boys, run up deep in the Jaheen voice. While you at the crib with your son watching Nickelodeon Teen Choice. <laughs> you often throw a lot of negative shots at each other, and they're not necessarily uh, genuine. Your mama joke, you know, your cousin, you know, any 
there's no boundaries, you know. I've heard all the type of jokes, all the type of like direct blaze. There's no smart, somebody might call it blaze. And it, was, it didn't have to be like, you know, I hate you. Boom, boom, boom. It's just you just battle with words, you know. It's as much about the language itself and the connections that are being made as it is about like how the language, like how it's being delivered. Like aiming that barrel, you roll in the flame, torching the game. Victor and Harrigan, then I'm a Harrigan. As much slang as we use in hip hop, there are probably more people that would have been English majors or writers in hip hop than there is in any other genre. Um, just the usage of words like metaphor, simile, double entendres, triple entendres. You might not even have a high school diploma and you know how to use these things. Well, When you're in a situation where people don't own property, unemployment is high, you don't really have anything, but talk is plentiful. It, it's very natural that you, you end up in a situation where there becomes a hierarchy based on how adept you are with using language. So think about it, though, and what he says about sort of the, the way you can use language in uh, double entendres triple entendres, you know, and how some of these people are so adept at using language, right, that they would have been English majors in a different world, that they're that expressive and good. So, so our latest one is on, a, we, we now have funding for a four-part series on, uh, on, on different dimensions of African-American speech, and so the one that was just accepted this week for viewing is about signing black in America. People don't realize that there is a dialect of American Sign Language that is peculiarly black in a way that is analogous to spoken sign language. So just sort of look at this trail.